Um, so thanks. It'd be about a couple of years ago, we were just I mean, looking at the data that we'd collected within the uh, Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. We said, given the information that's there, we should be able to do cumulative effects assessment different than what the status quo is for how folks do it in EIAs. And so we said, we take, if we took the ABMI information plus a bunch of other information, can we do cumulative effects assessment for biodiversity differently? And I'll jump to the end and say, yeah, we've tried it and it works, but there's a bunch of caveats. It works, but it's, it's not a gimme. There's, got, there's a bunch of things that are going to have to happen if one chose to move that way. So what I'll do then is briefly outline the, the work that we did in the project, and then, and then at the end talk about some of these other, other things that are also required. So I'm gonna first start with a very brief overview. This is an example from the Shell, uh, uh, Shell EIA that was done in the oil sands. It's not a great example or a bad example, it's just an example. So it's, it's an example of the status quo. It's ordinarily folks then map the vegetation and habitats that are at the place in the area where they're going to do the development, sample some critters, some key species in and around the area where it's going to be developed, and from that information develop some fairly coarse models of how biodiversity exists in the area and may well be affected by development in the area. This, this analysis isn't easy. So this work that's being done, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of bucks, and the folks are trying to do a great job. What we said, though, is maybe you can do it differently. Instead of focusing on the project area, focus at the regional scale, use not just the information collected for a particular spot, but all of the information you can get for the region, do a bit more complex modeling, and end up with information that allows you to talk about cumulative effects at the region and drill down to a particular area. What we said is, the reason we were even thinking about this, we said, you know, ABMI has quite a bunch of information that could be used. There is reasonable vegetation throughout Alberta, so there is maps of vegetation throughout Alberta, and there's maps of human footprint throughout Alberta. Now don't get me wrong, these maps aren't perfect but they're reasonable depictions of what you could find for vegetation and human footprint. From that, you could predict for any given region what you expect for vegetation in that region. The north part just off the top is Fort McMurray, and down at the bottom is Lac La Biche, and on the east side is Saskatchewan. So it's a reasonable side area. This is what I would call Sag D Alley. It's the place where we do institute development in the Athabasca deposit. And it's possible, though, to use existing information to come up with this kind of a map. It is also possible to use existing information to describe the characteristics of the human footprint, the human development that's in the area. And these are just a set of maps. The first map is for cut blocks, then well sites, then cut lines, and then other linear features. These maps, I caution you, are an exaggeration. You can't show cut lines at this scale and have them the actual size. So a cut line, just it's an exaggeration. But it gives you an idea of the dispersion of human footprints throughout that area. You can present it a different way that isn't an exaggeration. So this map on the left, it's just blue means there's relatively little human disturbance in a quarter section. And by the time you get to red, it means there's quite a lot of human disturbance at the, in that quarter section. And you can see that there's human disturbance throughout the whole of the region, but it's concentrated in certain spots. And this is just building on existing information. Now it's taken a whole bunch of time to get this information, but one can describe then the characteristics of any particular region you wish uh, for, and you could then use that in some sort of an assessment. And that's exact, so we just said, take that information on vegetation and human footprint, apply the Environment Canada's definition of what is good and bad habitat. So this is just applying somebody else's formula. You can then predict, based on, on the Environment Canada definition, the red would be relatively poor caribou habitat and the green is, is better habitat, good habitat. 
Um, and so you can get an idea of where you where you expect good and bad habitat throughout the area. In addition, you can use existing information to talk about how caribou interact with the other predator predators and prey in the system. We can do not just for existing models, but if you take information on the critters in in and around the region, so this is information throughout the whole of the boreal, one can then mine the data that we already have and use that mine data to evaluate what is a predictive model for any given species. So this is an example for black-throated green warbler. It just says that black-throated green warbler like some forest types more than they like other forest types. Their bars are higher. They're more abundant in some forest types than others. They tend to be more abundant in older forests than in younger forests. And the bottom graph just says as different types of human footprint in the landscape increases, black-throated green warblers tend to decrease. So this is just a modeling exercise, in this case for black-throated green warbler, that allows you then to understand how they use the habitat. And you can use the results of this model to predict what is the expected abundance of black-throated green. It's not really expected abundance. Think of it as habitat suitability. What is the habitat suitability for black-throated green in the region of interest in, two, in 2010 conditions? So it just gives us a map, if you wish, of habitat suitability for black-throated green. You can then say, what happens if I backfill all that human footprint? I remove it from the landscape and let the adjacent vegetation take up what used to be human footprint. What is the expected habitat suitability of black sort of green when there's no human footprint in the landscape? And the difference between the two then is an, es is an estimate of what we presently have done to change the habitat suitability for black sort of green. And the green means we haven't changed habitat suitability very much. As you get into the yellows and reds, it means we've changed the habitat suitability for black sort of green. A, a bit more to a lot. And from an ABMI language, we call that intactness. But really, it's just change in habitat suitability for each species. I've showed you the results for black sort of green warbler. You can do it, for, if, as long as you can find the data, you can do this modeling for every species. So here's just some examples of what we did for a series of 32 old forest bird species. So it's, there's 32 different species. We did the same analysis for each of them. And the map on the left is then the average of this intactness across those 32 species. And the one on the right is the average intactness for weedy species in the same area. Two things to notice. One, it allows you, by doing, creating a metric that's comparable across species, it allows you to sum things up across groups. So you can then not just have to talk about individual species, but you can sometimes get a conglomerate across a group of species. The second thing to think about is the answers aren't the same for each species or for each group. The maps have some similarity. These are two different groups of species, some similarities, but there's a bunch of differences between them. So as you look at different types of species, you tend to get somewhat different answers. One can take. Those were just two groups of species. You can do the things for all plants, and all birds, and all mammals, and all mosses. And so you can do it for all of, the, all of the information you can find. You can calculate these relationships. In this, in this project, we just did it for birds and plants. But we used about 120 plants and 70 or 80 birds. And you end up then with a map of, the, of intactness, if you wish, for biodiversity throughout the region. So this, the goal when we started was said, can we use existing information to talk about cumulative effects? Think of it as uh, the change that we have put onto the environment already. So the cumulative change for biodiversity in the region. And can we do it in a way that allows a spatial representation of that cumulative effects? So we look at cumulative effects not just as the total region, but what are the cumulative effects in different parts throughout the region? 
So by doing it at a pixel by pixel level, quarter section level, it allows one then to summarize the whole region or summarize any part of the region that you're especially interested in. By doing one analysis, one can then summarize the information at any other level that you're interested in. And sure enough, we can do it. I mean, we weren't surprised. This turns out to be a lot of work. But it's not surprising. As long as you have the data, you can hire bright people and they'll do smart things with the data. <clears throat> we also said, and this is mostly just a proof of concept because we were sure we could do it. We said, can we use the models to predict what the expected cumulative effects in tactness would be into the future? So we created a simulation of human footprints. It's a core simulation. Don't take these maps as what we expect in the future. We did it as a proof of concept. All we did was simulate increased well sites, increased seismic, and increased pipelines into the future based on the thickness of the bitumen deposit. So it's a very, very coarse simulation in the future. But if you simulate into the future, there is absolutely no reason not or that you can't apply models that you've created to the future conditions to look at what is the expected cumulative effects in the future. These maps aren't right, so don't take the maps home, but the math is fairly simple to do. Or simple. The math is a pain to do, but conceptually it's very simple to do. <clears throat> so, in summary, we can model and map changes in habitat suitability or changes in intactness or, or cumulative effects. And we can do it for present condition. We can do it into the future if we can create those future simulated landscapes. And you can summarize it at any scale you like. So if you produce it and predict it at a quarter section level or some small level, you can summarize up to any level you like. It's lots of work, but you can do it. One of the neat things, and it wasn't really what we were thinking about when we started, but one of the neat things is if you go this route of producing the assessment at a regional level, one can use the resulting information not just in an EIA sort of context, but in a wide variety of other contexts. As society, we do a bunch of management and planning at the regional level, at uh, uh, maybe even at the province level, and this kind of modeling then could feed both our broad scale planning and management, plus also feed into uh, some sort of cumulative effects for, for EIAs. So a fairly coarse summary. I think there's nothing, I don't think, real hard to understand here. Right now, we tend to focus on small areas, do a bunch of good work in those small areas, but they, the results are focused on the small areas. What we did in this project is said, can we broaden it up to talk about a regional context and still be able to evaluate ecological consequences in the smaller area? Can we present it in a way that would allow you to evaluate ecological consequences at the smaller area? And as we did that, we realized that if one took this more regional concept, assessed use a regional uh, analysis of cumulative effects, it would feed into things like the land use planning sorts of things, the regional planning initiatives. It also feed into some sort of a protected area strategy if you wanted to go there. It would feed into things like conservation offsets. You could use the information for a variety of other tools if you wish. The other thing that we realized is as you start to broaden the scope, it becomes pretty critical to tie monitoring in so that it satisfies it. One can't kind of keep these things separate. You almost have to start to think of this as a concept, whereas if we choose to go this way, we would go the way, this way and try to amalgamate things up and try to integrate things across a variety of different planning scenarios. This is. This is me now going out on a limb, guys, OK? So I might be all wrong. However, I don't mind going out on a limb at the end of the day. I think there would be value in at least contemplating, can we, can we think about doing cumulative effects differently than we presently do in EIAs? So we would, can we integrate our cumulative effects assessment for biodiversity at the local level with the regional? Well, basically, it's do it at the regional level and from that extract the local. 
that could allow you then, allow folks to share costs. It means that we would end up with an assessment that's consistent across all areas so that you're not comparing apples and oranges between different little developments. It also means that one could then house the resulting information in one spot so folks would know where to go to find it. So you don't have it separated all across the different spots. Um, it would allow, if it was done once, it would be allowed to, be, to have it updated, the whole region updated. Basically, you could update it yearly, if you wish, or after every X number of developments. So you could see how the cumulative effects was changing over time and whether or not you were getting, you know, whether or not you're predicted cumulative effects, because that's what you're doing in the future. You're predicting what you think is going to be a cumulative effect in the future. And I like to, I like to think of predicting cumulative effects like you predict the weather. I mean, I can predict it's going to snow next Monday. But most people in this room wouldn't believe me. Now, it's not that I'm wrong, but we realize that predictions are predictions in the weather case. And we know that lots of times we're not as close as we think we are. The same thing goes with cumulative effects. We can predict cumulative effects into the future, but we may well be wrong. If we update our models, update our assessment, after two or three years as new developments have happened, we can then test our predictions. And then over time, we'll get better at predicting. So it allows an adaptive management framework for cumulative effects assessment. So that's the value proposition. I think what's also becoming very obvious, obvious is it's not a gimme. Um, the reason folks do cumulative effects for EIAs the way they presently do it is because it makes sense within the right present regulations, within the present way we do business. Um, it's not that the present regulations say you, we can't collaborate to do a regional cumulative effects, but we do force developers to do a cumulative effects for biodiversity in their particular area. So we definitely aren't facilitating this regional type of assessment. Um, there's also a bit of momentum in the past, we've collected lots of data as we do cumulative effects, and people are kind of expecting you to go collect more data. And I'm not sure whether folks are going to be real keen to say, uh, we're not going to collect any more data. We're just going to use what's already available. There's some momentum that's going to be hard to break. <clears throat> I talked about the GIS layers. I mean, those are reasonable layers, but the layers ain't perfect. In fact, as you drill more and more into those GIS layers, they get less and less perfect. Um, so there would be value. There's necessary to make the layers better if we choose to move this general direction. Um, and we really, as a society, don't have very good capabilities of predicting future conditions. It's, it's, we just don't have it. Now, I think it could be developed, but we don't have it right now. Um, we also then have to embrace the idea that we would like to use adaptive management to, to test our predictions. So there, is, there, there are some significant barriers to change. What I'd like to suggest, and I said I was out on a limb, I've now stepped to the end of the limb. <laughs> I think there would be real value in piloting something like this in an area. So if folks could wrestle in their mind and say, you know, I think there's some value here. If we could find an area and just pilot to see whether it's going to work. Validate whether the method works. Now, we know we can do it for a few species, but is it going to work for all the species that we need to include in EIAs? Um, what kind of delivery model do you need? Who's going to do the work and how? What kind of costs are we really looking at? Now, in these questions you can guess at, but you're not going to know the answers to it until you actually try it. And the other part that's big is how would one try to integrate the work that's done for a for a project level EIA cumulative effects with the broader regional cumulative effects. That's, that's a big one. I don't even, that one's going to be hard to crack. But I think it'd be great to try and tackle it in a pilot. 